Christ. Okay. So let's get started, and we'll interrupt a little and go back. So. Okay, we're good to go. Chapter 6, verse 11. So this is one of the most unusual verses in the Megillah because most of the verses contain like a subtext, a story that's encoded into the verse. And you have to analyze the verse carefully and you, you look at the verbiage kind of you read into the nuances, the subtleties, and, and a story gets discovered. It's like tip of the iceberg. You notice a little fissure, a little crack. It makes you look more deeply. But this pasuk actually has no fissures, no cracks. Nothing tips us off. It's just a straightforward verse. It's so straightforward that there's virtually no commentary in this verse, hardly any commentary. However, there's an enormous amount of rabbinic tradition that's associated with this verse. At least three versions of a fascinating story which I'm going to share with you. So, so typically when we study a Pasuk in the Megillah, I'll read to you the Pasuk, we'll study a Pasuk, I'll say why, why did the Megillah use this language or that language or seemingly there would have been a simpler way to say this. I can't, I can't tell you anything like that. I could just tell you that the Maharsha comments on the Talmud that gives us the narrative because we have it in the Talmud and we have it in the Medrash. He comments and he says that we have a tradition, a Kabbalah from our sages that this is how the story happened. It's not indicated at all inside the actual verse. It's, it's, the three versions are the Medrash Abba, the Gemara Talmud Bavli, and what's called the Targum Sheni, the Targum on the Megillah, the Medrashic Targum. All of them have slight nuances, a little bit different, written in different times, written by different people, but you can see it's the same story. And the Mam Lois does a beautiful job of kind of fusing it all together with a little bit of rabbinic commentary that we have. So with no further ado, that's how, that's how it begins. Let us start the beginning of the verse, Vayikach Haman. You'll all remember that in the previous verse, Achashverosh informed Haman that he loves his idea. Beautiful idea. Well, not for him though. He says, you go, hurry. Take that royal apparel. Take that horse. And you're going to do all the things you just said to Mordechai. And Haman begins to choke. He says, you've got to be kidding. I, I. And Ahasuerus says, immediately, not one detail should be left behind. Haman is rightfully terrified. Remember, this is the king who killed his wife. It will be easier to kill his prime minister. And now, Haman already understands that Ahasuerus is suspicious of him. And he suspects him of disloyalty. And, and Haman doesn't know how to prove that he's loyal. He, like, the more, the more he protesteth, the more, the more he becomes implicated. Mm -hmm. So this, is, this, is, this sets the stage for what Haman's about to do now because Haman has two issues. Number one, he doesn't want anybody to know about what, what he's about to do. He, he doesn't want to get up and announce this. Number two, he's terrified of any detail missing. If Ahasuerus shares of a single detail that isn't carried out right, he's liable to behead him on the spot or to have him swinging from the gallows. So Haman, with all this in mind, sets out, and he takes the garment, the royal apparel, he takes Esasus, takes the horse, Vayalbesh Es Mordechai, and he dresses Mordechai. Mm -hmm. So all we, all we really know from the verses that Haman took the, the, the apparel, he took the horse, and he dressed Mordechai. That's all we know. That's mm -hmm. all we know. He didn't send anybody else to do it, because Ahasuerus said, you, you, but you have to do this. Maher, but you said, you have to do it. And you have to do this. So he, he can't pass this off to anybody else. He can't risk making the king angry. But he goes and does this. And then it says, He has him riding through on horseback through the center of town. And he's calling out before him as he was commanded to, which was his idea, thrown right back at him. This is what happens to the person that the king wants him to be honored. All right, so let me tell you now the backstory. Firstly, when Haman goes to get the apparel and the horse, we don't have, and the Medrash doesn't tell us much, and the Gemara doesn't tell us anything, 
but the, but the Targum Sheni does. The Targum Sheni describes in great details that when Haman saw his words falling on deaf ears, Ahasuerus is not listening to him. And he really had no choice. So he himself left the, the royal bedroom where Ahasuerus was sleeping. This is in the wee hours of the morning. And he himself has to go off to the royal chambers where the clothing is kept. And we talked about this was the clothing that Ahasuerus wore on the day of his inauguration. It was in some kind of museum. He had to go into that special place by himself. And then he had to go to the royal stables. And he had to get that special horse that Ahasuerus had ridden on the day of his inauguration or coronation. And he does so with tremendous heartbreak. Haman is crushed. The Medrash says that he, he does so bekfifas koima. His shoulders are slumped. And he's like a person who has just lost a loved one. He's in mourning. Every, the Medrash describes in details how everything is. His, his, his eyes are drooping. His ears are falling. His, his face is, 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 is contorted. It goes into all details of describing how his knees are knocking together. You're looking at a broken man. You look at the, you, this is an unrecognizable person. He walked in with a swagger. He was planning to have Mordechai hung. And he left utterly crushed. A broken person. And this broken person has to go looking through the royal closets till he finds the exact garment he was looking for. And he has to take that garment and then he's got to go to the, <coughs> the, the, the stable all by himself. And he leaves there totally discombobulated. Like he's, he's, he, he can't even pull himself together. He can't believe what's just happened to him. It's happened in a flash. He went from the heights all the way to the crushing lows. And he takes this horse which has still this, this gold chain of office upon it. And heartbrokenly, he begins to walk towards Mordechai. So that gives us a little, a little bit of background. <coughs> the the um, Mamloyes uses a little more colorful language, but this, this, this is the bottom line. Mamloyes also tells us that he leads the horse by the, by the, you know, the, 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 the reins. He leads the horse by the reins. And here is Haman, like a simple servant, leading a horse by the reins, coming to Mordechai. Now, Mordechai sees what's going on, and he gets very frightened. He gets very frightened. Let me tell you the version of the Medrash. The Medrash says that when, when Mordechai saw Haman coming, so Mordechai said, Tzugazunt. He gidu the Mardachai. They told Mardachai. They tipped him off. Mardachai was in, in the Beit Medrash. He was surrounded by thousands of children that he was learning Torah with and his students. And they told Mardachai, Haman's coming. And Haman's coming with, with his horse. So the Medrash says, Nisyore ad ma'id. He was very frightened when he heard this. V'hoya Yoshev v'talmid of Lofanov. He's sitting and his students were before him. The Medrash says, Mardachai said to his students, Amr lehem l'talmid of Bonai. He called him his children. Because a real Rebbe is like a father. He said to his children, he said, students said, children run away. He bodlumikan, separate yourself from here. And he uses poetic expression, I don't want you to get burned in my coal. He says, I have to own this. He's coming after me. I'm the one who, you know, picked a fight with Haman. I'm the one who didn't bow his head. I don't want you to get harmed. I don't want you to get hurt. He was worried about their, their safety and security. So instead of saying, stay with me, protect me, try, he said, go away. Go away, leave me to my fate. He, he felt it's over. This is, this is the way things are going to go. Share Haman Arosha Bala Hargeni. Haman is coming to kill me. That's what he says. They responded to him and they said, Amru, they said, Im Tamus, if you die, Nomus Imcha, we die with you. We're not leaving you. Amr Lahem, he said, If so, Im Kain Naamai Bitfila, then let us together pray. Venifta Mertechat Fila, let us be killed praying to Hashem. The presence of mind. That's how he's, he thought he's going to die now. Now the Gemara has a little bit of a different version of this. The Gemara just says that uh, you know, like, like I told you, Mashar says we have these stories passed down to us, and he says he found. Haman went. Ashkeche, Haman went, and he found the Yasvid Abon Kameh. He found that the rabbis were sitting before him, the yeshiva students. And the Gemara just says, Umach velohu hilchas kmitza. He was demonstrating to them the laws of kmitza. Now, the laws of kmitza are a little bit different than what the Medrash says he was teaching them. And the Medrash says that he said, let us pray. We don't find that in the, in the Gemara. Although, later, the Gemara 
after describing what he was learning, the Gemara does go on to say that when he saw Haman coming, Kevan de Chazio Mordechai. In the Medrash, he says he heard he was coming. He was tipped off. He was told. But in the Gemara, it says he saw. When he saw with his eyes, the Apek, Likible, Vesuse, Mechad Biyade, he saw Haman coming in there. And he has the reins of the horse, of the royal horse in his hands, Mirtas. Then he became very frightened. And he told the rabbis, Hai Rishia Lemiktel Nafshikasi. This wicked man is coming to kill me now. And so he said, He's coming to kill me. Why don't you zilu mikame? Go away from here. Delay tikavu begachalosay. Don't be burned by his coal. So again, different version. In the medrash, it's my coal, meaning I have to own this fire. This destruction is mine. I want to be killed. I don't want you to be harmed. In the in the gemara, don't be burned by his fire. It's it's his fire of anger. It's his fire of of retribution. Now the gemara goes on to say, by he shaita at that time. Nisatif Mardachai, Mardachai wrapped himself in his talus, Vikam Lilit Slaisa, and he began to pray. Now there's no mention of the students saying, We don't want you to be left alone. If you die, we die. There's no mention of that. But the interesting thing is that right after it says Asa Haman, Haman came, the Yasavli Kamayo, he sat down, like you know, as if he was one of the boys. He sat down with the students and he began to talk to them. And he said, he was waiting for Mardachai to finish praying. And he said to them, Bamaya Sikto, what are you guys what are you guys doing? And then they began to tell him about the subject they were studying. So he's waiting for Mordechai to finish praying, and he they begin to converse. So do me a favor. Call the radio, I'll do the radio, and I'll, we'll come back to this. So what happens is in the in the Medrash it doesn't say that 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 the students were just sitting there and waiting. It says Mordechai said to them, Let us pray. Let us pray together, because they all they expect to be killed together. And the Gemara, it doesn't say, the Gemara says Mardachai was praying. <coughs> so here's the interesting thing. The, the Mepharshim point out that from the fact that Achashverosh, Mardachai said, run away. And then Haman comes over, not Achashverosh, Haman comes over and he says, but Maya Sikta, what, what are you involved with? What do we know from this? Something's missing here. Right? Just listen, tell me when he comes to Mordechai says go. The Rebbe says go and nobody listens. Why are they there? How does Haman find him there when he comes? So the Mepharshim say from this we could see that the students were told by Mordechai to leave but they must have said we're not going to leave you. In other words, I'm just demonstrating the same story. Exactly the wor- verbiage, exactly how it was, was brought down. Clearly Mordechai was worried about their safety and security and I think it's important to share. You want, you, this gives us a window into Mordechai's personality. It's a person's last moments. What's he thinking of? thinking of others. Just think of his students. Run away. You shouldn't be harmed. This, this, is, this is trouble. I'll own it. And it also shows you the loyalty of Mordechai's students. You know, this is your life over here. You're not playing games. You're gonna, they said, no, no. You die, we die. Rebbe, whatever happens with you is happening with us too. We're staying right here. We will not be going anywhere. So, and, and you see it in both versions. And here's where it gets really interesting. Why was Mordechai so afraid? Haman did not come armed. Haman did not come with a swagger. Haman doesn't come full of himself. If it's true what the Medrash uh, Tagum Sheni says, that he was so broken, and it was so obvious, you should have been able to see in his body language he's a broken man. And yet, the Gemara emphasizes he saw. And when he saw, he became very, very frightened. Haman, Haman never instilled fear in Mordechai before. Only now does he instill fear in Mordechai. Why is this? So this is discussed at length by the Ben Yehiyada, the Chida, one of the greatest Sephardic sages of the 18th century. And he says something amazing. He says, we know that Haman was prime minister for exactly 70 days. On the 70th day, he was swinging from the gallows because towards evening he was done. So just after 70 days. The whole business, the whole Haman is 70 days. We talked about this actually in a previous class. And he says something very interesting. He says there's a tradition that in antiquity, in Persia, that a prime minister would have what we would call a 70-day kind of uh, a test period, period, a trial period, to see how he, would, how he would do. And during that 70 days, he had no right to do anything on his own. But after 70 days passed, then he could even take life on his own. Because if you went through the trial period, which gives us such an... Like, 
how unbelievable is this? If Haman had come, decided to hang Mordechai a day later, the story would have been, had a very different ending. The only reason Haman couldn't do this is because it was day 69. Day 70. Day 70 dawned that day. He came on the eve of the 70th. And if he had waited just another 12 hours, if he could have contained his hatred just a little bit longer, everything would have worked out. Hello? Hi, Zelda. It's always nice to be on air. You know, I'm in the middle of a class, but when you call Zelda, I got, I got, I got to answer. Especially this is, this is our first day on a the, on the new station. 91.9 FM. I, I, you know, I just want to say something, Zelda. We have a, a, a tradition that when it comes to matters of holiness, we always have to wax, not wane. We always have to add. So we may have moved to a different station, and our timing may have changed, but as you said, Ottawa has now been added to the repertoire, and so at least we're growing. At least the audience is continuing to expand. I'm, I'm not really sure how to respond, Zelda. I mean, I mean, it, it, let, let me say this. I, mean, I'll, I want to say I'll say three things. You're 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 talking about um, the widow of Arifold participating in her daughter's marriage, but you didn't talk for a moment about the fact that her, his daughter is actually getting married. And an interesting question that people have asked, I've actually had to field this question, is may you get married in the year of mourning for a parent? And here's uh, Ari Fold was murdered, and it's during the period of, of, of mourning for a parent, and when you lose a parent, you don't even go to a wedding, much less actually get married yourself. So how, how is it that, that she got married now? And, and Oh, only, only, only a couple of months. You, you know, your question was about Ari's widow, but according to the halacha, the mourning ended for Ari's widow after 30 days, but the, 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 the mourning for Ari's daughter is very much still in place. And the answer, Zelda, is this. During the year of mourning, we do our best to try to help and elevate a neshama. And the greatest elevation for a holy soul like Ari Fold is to see his children get married and to build the next link in the chain that takes us back to Revelation at Sinai and to the glorious past of our nation in the Holy Land of Israel as we move forward into a wonderful future. Marriage is the greatest mitzvah, Zelda. There is no other mitzvah in the Torah for which an abundance of blessings are made. Under the chuppah, there are nine blessings. People know about the Sheva Brachot, but there are actually nine blessings recited under the chuppah. And then at the end of the wedding dinner, there's another seven blessings, special blessings that are recited in honor of the Chatan and the Kala, which gives us a sum total of, of 18 blessings, 18, uh, 17, 16 to 17 blessings that are recited in one evening, many of them repetitious, in one evening, Zelda, only because of the mitzvah of marriage. And, and that gives us a, a sense of how important marriage is from a Torah perspective, and how, yes, there are laws of mourning, but those laws of mourning are suspended when it comes to getting married, when it comes to building a bayat neman be Yisrael. I, I want to tell you something. You, you, you've discussed or talked about the image, the searing image of Ari's widow leading her daughter uh, down to the chuppah, but we may not be able to see it, but Ari Feld was there because even though during the first year and the Shamas are very busy, and they, they, we, we tend not to visit the grave and the shamas are preoccupied, but when there's a wedding of a child or a grandchild, you can be sure that the neshama is participating. And I have no doubt that Ari is at this wedding and that he is having enormous nachas, tremendous joy from the fact that his family has found the strength to pull themselves together and to continue to soldier on in as much as we hope and pray that very, very soon and in our time, we will not have to deal with sadness and travail and mourning, but instead, a Yishama Ba'ari Yehuda, 
as the verse says, there will be a song that is heard in the hills of Yehuda. And that song, Zelda, is the song of Kel Chasan Vakel Simcha. Kel Sasan Vakel Kala. It's a song of, song of joy and the sound of jubilation of uh, the wedding sounds, with, with uh, many, many weddings being held in the Holy Land of Eretz Yisrael. But really and truly, the greatest wedding of all, the, the reuniting of God and His people in the third base of Migdash, which is our marital home, Bimheira will be Amen speedily, and in our days, Amen. Thank you, Zelda. It's a wonderful privilege. And there's never a second time to have a first day. So I'm, I'm glad we got to do this. Thank you. So much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Shkoyach. Rabbi, you rehearsed. You knew everything beforehand. I have no idea what she's going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seemed like it was scripted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you saw I don't have a script. <laughs> and I have no idea what she's going to ask. All right, so let's get back to, 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 um, to the subject. So why did he become so frightened? He became frightened because Mordechai wasn't sure how the la land of the law worked. If you had, was in the 70th day, meaning on day 70, Haman had free reign, or it was only after 70 days passed. Now, Mordechai was very knowledgeable. He was actually a courtier in Nachashverosh's court. He was, he was a member of parliament. He sat in, in, on the compound, in the royal compound. He had a position. He had a desk. He, 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 he had a business card. I mean, he, he was a member of the government. A and he knew how government functions. He knew about the 70 days, the trial period, and he had ignored Haman all along. And the Ben Yehiada suggests that people knew, I've never seen this actually anywhere, but he suggests to Ben Yehiada that people knew that Mordechai had a relationship with Esther, that he had raised her. They didn't know she was Jewish. They knew that he had adopted an orphan. So there was, they knew there was a special connection. They didn't know what it was. Nobody knew what her faith is. Nobody knew where, what her ethnicity is. And that's what they had tried so hard to find out. But Esther, being a true chassid, she listened to Mordechai, never ever buckled, didn't break. And when Ahasuerus, she even threatened her. She, you know, she, she stood him down and said, please, you have to respect my dignity. And he, and he did. And if not for Esther's having done that, again, who knows how things would have turned out. So Ahash, Haman, Haman is in the 70th day of his prime ministership. He's being on the, on the cusp of becoming literally a man with almost unlimited power unless the king <coughs> decides to mix in. But if the king doesn't get involved or engaged, he can really do as he pleases. He can take life. And from a halachic perspective, the power of life and death actually defines royalty. There was a Hasidic Rebbe. I'm not going to mention his name. He's not alive anymore today. Um, he met... Queen Elizabeth, either at the coronation or shortly after the coronation. That was 1954, right? Uh, 53. <coughs> anyway, uh, 53. And, and uh, this Hasidic Rebbe at that time was living in London. He was a, a survivor of the camps. I don't remember if he was in Auschwitz or Buchenwald. And his father was murdered. His family, all his family had died. I believe his wife was killed. Except with the exception of one son. And, and um, you know, people said he was never really groomed to become the Rebbe, that he had an older brother who was considered to be a much, much more prominent individual. Anyway, it's not, it's not important. The bottom line is he does end up becoming a Hasidic leader and he built an incredible community, an incredible, he revi revitalized literally a shattered Hasidic group. But anyway, but I, I, I don't know that he was that learned or, so he met the queen and he made this official blessing that one recites upon meeting a king or a queen. And he was, he was ridiculed mm. by many people because Queen Elizabeth isn't really a queen. She doesn't have the power of life and death in her hands. A real monarch means the power of life and death. So, so the answer they came back with is that I, I think in maybe the Virgin Islands, no, the Virgin Islands wasn't, wasn't British. One of the British islands, one of the islands that was under the sway of Britain, that they had a death penalty, but the queen had the power to stay the death penalty. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, she does have the power of life. She can't commit somebody to death, but she has the power to save. Anyway, be that as it may, the, the halachic discussion of whether it was appropriate or wasn't appropriate to make the blessing is a secondary concern. That's not the issue. I want to explain to you how the concept of monarchy, 
when you want to define it halakhali, what is a monarch? Is, is, is a CEO of a huge company a monarch? Is the person has the right to, to fire people? Is he a monarch? Does that make you a person a queen? The answer is no. No, it's, it's, it's a powerful position. Does it make you a monarch? Is a prime minister a monarch? No. Prime ministers do all kinds of things. Lots of corrupt things sometimes too, but it doesn't make them a monarch. Are they a monarch? Is a president a monarch? No, a president's not a monarch. People would argue that the president could declare war and therefore he's a monarch. That's not what it means. The idea of a monarch means literally that you look at a person and say, off with your head. You want to know who's a monarch? Ahasuerus is a monarch. But the frightening thing is that Haman was hours away from becoming monarch-like. He would have evolved monocarchally and become a person who could take other people's lives. He had to come to Ahasuerus to ask permission because he was in his last day of the trial. And he knew that Ahasuerus was a very, very suspicious person. And he didn't allow people a lot of freedom. He was a, he was a, he was a very, very, very shrewd operator, political operator. And in the political science, you know, you're always kind of bringing people low, making people high, creating a balance of power. Ahasuerus is very into that. And, and in fact, when he says to Haman, you do it, it's exactly what he meant. That's, 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 what he, that's, what he, that's what he was planning to do. But we don't know that he was planning this prior to Haman's request. So Haman actually sank himself in his hatred, his blind hatred for, for the Jewish people that he couldn't allow Mordechai to live another day. He had to hang him today. So he had to get Ahasuerus' permission. He was sure he would get the permission, but he had to still go ask permission. His hatred is what destroyed him. And hatred does destroy people. People who hate, their hatred destroys them. I mean, the terrifying thing is that Hitler, Yomachshimo, if he hadn't bogged down all of his, all, so, much, so, so much resources in killing the, the people, Jew, Jewish people, he could have won the war. He actually, he actually, he, 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 he in, in, a, in a frenzied way, put so much emphasis on defeating and killing his enemies who weren't his enemies. Instead of, instead of he diverted forces from the theater, war theater. I, I've, I've read in history books that the, the outcome of the war could have been different. I mean, imagine if Einstein would have stayed in Germany. Imagine if Einstein would have been inducted into the German armed forces to develop the nuclear bomb for the Germans. Mm -hmm. We'd all be speaking German now. Or Churchill wasn't strong enough. Um, yeah. Churchill's strength is, you know, not only to talk about it, but I'm saying the, the reality is that it was his hatred that destroyed him in the end. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, almost like textbook in history. People who hate will be devoured and destroyed by their own hatred. This is the story of Haman. His anti-Semitism, his hatred for Mordechai, illogical hatred, was insane hatred. Had he waited a day, finished, could have done as he pleased. He had to go the day before. Now, Mordechai doesn't know the exact details of the law. You, you call a lawyer, he says, you know, I'll call you back. He has to go look it up in the library. It's not a common law. Mordechai hadn't researched how long is the trial period. And in halacha, usually, part of a day is good enough, especially when it comes to something like mourning. So, for example, we sit Shiva not for seven days, but in seven days. And that's why the day of the funeral is considered to be one of the days of Shiva. And the day you get up from the Shiva, you just have to sit Shiva for a few moments, and then you get up. And then you've sat Shiva already in the seventh day. And I'm sure for Mordechai, this whole thing was like a Shiva. <laughs> so in his mind, and he sees Haman coming, he didn't notice his stooped gait. He didn't notice the body language, which kind of you know, was leaking all over the place, tell, telling you this is a broken man. What he saw is the royal horse. And when he saw the royal horse, in Mordechai's confusion, what did he think? He said, ah, he's, he's holding the royal horse. That means he's assumed power today. He's probably going to be riding the horse soon. So Mordechai said, ah, now it's over. Till now, I wasn't afraid. Till now, because everybody knew that I had a special relationship with Esther, Esther would save my life. So Mordechai knew that Ahasuerus would, push comes to shove, Ahasuerus would stand by him. He wouldn't kill him. But Haman now has free reign. So he sees him coming with the horse, he becomes terrified, and he's certain this is his last moment. He tells everybody, run away, he's going to kill me now. They say to him, we're sticking by you. And that's, before the words, that's like, Haman went, so we have the whole story of how he went. And right here, you kind of have to make like a break and insert a whole lot of stuff of Haman going, Haman coming, Haman bringing, Mordechai's response and a conversation that we're now going to read about that ensues between Haman and the students of Mordechai. And then a conversation, that conversation continues 
with between Mordechai and Haman himself. Now, why was Haman so respectful? And according to the Gemara, he's letting Haman finish praying and he's engaging in a conversation with, with his disciples. Haman had no respect for prayer. Haman had no time for, for, for some Jew davening. It doesn't make any sense. Haman had a job to do. He was terrified for his own life. So he should have said, Hey, Mordechai, hey, now we have to do something. But instead, he respectfully watches Mordechai Davin wrapped in his talisman film and doesn't do anything. How come? Not film, sorry, it was Yomtev, wrapped in his talus. So I saw something very interesting. The, the, um, the Sif Sikham says, first of all, Haman, Haman, Haman believed in God. Like a lot of our enemies, he did believe. He just hated us. So he wanted to disturb Mordechai's prayers. And he figured when Haman would stand right there, Mordechai wouldn't have the presence of mind to pray. But this is a man who had the presence of mind to tell the students to run away. This is a man who had the presence of mind to say, if he's going to kill me, I want, I want to be praying when he kills me. I shared this before, but the, my father heard this from one of the survivors, first-hand account, in, in a Lithuanian city called Baranovich. The Jewish population was herded into the shul, or the yeshiva, the largest synagogue, which was the yeshiva. And the Rosh Yeshiva is a very, very famous Lithuanian sage, Jewish sage, whose name was Rabbi Chanan Vassarman. Rabbi Vassarman was one of the great Rosh Yeshiva of the previous generation. And they were herded into the yeshiva in Baranovich. And in this particular instance, instead of taking them to a ditch and shooting them into a ditch and burying them in a mass grave, they decided they would burn the shul with its inhabitants, with the, with the contents, so to speak. And they nailed the doors shut. They, nailed, they boarded the windows. And the Jews herded inside could hear the sound of fire and smell the fumes outside. And they realized where this is going to go. There was no escape. Nazis, or probably local Lithuanians, with rifles in their hands, surrounded the building. Should anybody try to escape, they would shoot him. And they would burn the shul and the assembled Jews. So the story that, that I heard is that Rebbe Khan went on to the bima, and he said, we cannot understand what's about to happen now, but for reasons beyond our understanding, Hashem has decided to take us as a korban, as a sacrifice. And he said, a korban, if it has... The Kohen has bad thoughts when he brings the Korban, then the Korban becomes disqualified. This is called in the Talmudic lexicon, Pigul. Pigul means it's like expelled, cast aside. He said, so if we have the wrong thought when we bring the Korban, the Korban is not a Korban, it becomes a, it's, it's mefagil, it disqualifies the Korban. So the Bukharan said, let us not die with anger against Hashem or questions. Why is God doing this? Let us die with faith. Let us together say Shema Yisrael. Let us die with loyalty to Hashem, not with questions to Hashem. Can you imagine the presence of mind? <laughs> People talk about, why didn't the Jews fight? What did you want them to do? Talk about spiritual courage. Who, who has spiritual courage like this? Who, who, who does this? Our people did. And there were some survivors, very, very few. Young people who ran out from the inferno. And, and somehow survived the bullets, the hail of bullets that surrounded them. And one such person conveyed, and there was a number of survivors, but one of those people conveyed the story to my father. So Mordechai, this is a, 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 a microcosmically, I don't, I don't think it's as dramatic, but Mordechai is about to be killed. And what does he want? He says, it's fine. I want to wear my talus. I'll die for being Jewish. Oh, that's fine. This is who Mordechai is in this, another Lithuanian town called Dukshitz. So the Rav was a man whose name was Rabbi Rechmiel Ben Yamansen. And he was a, it's called the Dukshitz Rav, he was a Lubavitch Chassid. I'm pretty sure it was him. So, I might be mixing a name. It may have been Leib Shainen. It was the Rav and Dukshitz, that, that, this I remember. Anyway, the Nazis decided to have fun with him. He was a, you know, very beautiful looking rabbi, with a nice white beard. And so they, they boarded up the shul here too. I'm going to burn the shul. And they said they'll have fun with him, have fun with the rabbi before they kill him. There's a, there's a picture that's very, very widely distributed. It's, 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 very, it's been publicized over the last 70 years of a, of a man saying Kaddish. He's barefoot, his tefillin are broken open. Mm -hmm. Right? So there's also a similar story. I'll go back to the story of Dukshitz in a minute. This, the man's name was Moshe Hagerman. 
and and I, I, I today it's identified, but actually for David Korn from our shul, his mother was there. So that was her rabbi. She was in she was in this, this town called I think Akluch, Akluch, Akliz or Akluch. She said they killed dozens of Jews, and they, they were going to kill him. And he said, first I want to say Kaddish. So they went to say Kaddish before they killed him. And, that's, and you see that he's brutalized in this film that bro- broken open. The story with the Leib Shein is, or, or the Dr. Tzidov, whoever that was, he said, they said, they want, they said, you have a last wish. As you watch your, first watch your people burn, then, so he said, yeah, I want, I want to say for Torah. So they brought him to say for Torah, and he began to sing the Nigan of Simcha's Torah. Mm-hmm. And that's how he died. That's how he was shot. Holding a Torah, singing the song of Simcha's Torah. So this is, this is the, the imagery that we're seeing play out. Here, Baruch Hashem, there's a nice ending. But this is what Mordechai is awaiting. He's awaiting certain death. He thought Hamo would kill him on the spot. He didn't know about the gals. And he said, then so, then so I shall go. Then so I shall go. And he's wrapped in his talus. And Haman is intimidating him. Haman is figuring he's not going to daven well when I'm, when I'm here. And furthermore, another reason, the Ben Yehuda says something else amazing. He says, you know, if you want to connect to Hashem, there's one ingredient that's more important than anything else. What do you think that would be? The one ingredient more important than anything else for your prayers to be accepted, for you to be elevated spiritually? Joy. Joy. It says, Ein The divine presence only comes out of joy. So, Haman thought to himself, now Mordechai is davening in mourning. He's, he's, he's davening depressed. I don't want to interrupt his davening. Once I tell him the news, then he'll start davening joyously. Then God will really listen to him. So he said, I'm not going to interrupt him. Let him daven. And Haman said, ah, this is, not a good, this is not a joyous prayer. This is not going to work anyway. But of course, it, it already has. And things are, amazing things are about to happen. So, but first there's this conversation. And he says to them, what are you guys learning? What are you doing? So they say to him, we're learning about uh, laws of the Beit HaMikdash. Because in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, so then this, we would bring a, a meal offering, a korban mincha. And the reason he said a meal offering, so Rashi says, Hilchas Kmitza, Doidish ben Yanish Shalyayim. They're learning what's going on that day. What's going on that day? This is the second day of, Sukkot, of, of Pesach. What happens on the second day of Pesach? The fresh barley is cut. And then it's brought as an offering the next day. So they're learning what's supposed to happen that day. It's based on Migdash issues, but, but we don't have a base of Megdash, but let's we learn about it. Like when we read from the Torah on the days of Yom Tov of the offerings of that day. The idea of Unashalma Parmas Fatenu, we cannot do it, so we speak of it, we study it as per the, the, the uh, dictate, di- dictum of our sages, called Ha'oisik, but Torah's Eila, anybody who involves himself in the study of the Korban Ola, of the Ascent Offering, Ki'ilu Hikirav Eila, it's as if you brought the Ascent Offering. So this is the second day of Pesach, so that's what they're doing. And this is Vashisha Asar ben Nisan Hayyot, was the 16th day of Nisan, which is called Yom Tnufas HaOmer, the day of raising up the Omer. Basically, on Matzoi Yom Tov, in Eretz Yisrael, there's one day of Yom Tov, and on the night after Yom Tov ends, they would go out into the, the, the fields. And they would cut the Omer. The Omer would be cut from one of the fields, not necessarily in Jerusalem, but usually very close to it. We know, for example, from the story of Ruth, that the Omer was being cut, on, in the city called Bethlehem. And so it's called Bethlehem. That was the breadbasket of that particular area. The most wheat grew in those hills. It wasn't done on Matzah Yom Tov. I'm sorry. It was done on, 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 the, on, the, on the end of the second day of Yom Tov. And that's why it was a big deal. It had to be done. Because you're cutting wheat. Because that's what Torah commands. And they say, they would say everything they would do. Because there were those who denied that this was supposed to be done. They said it doesn't say it openly in the scripture. And they would say, Magalza, Magalza, Magalza. Three times it's a sickle. It's a sickle. It's a sickle. A sickle. Yeah. This is, wheat, this is barley, this is barley, this is barley. Today is Yom Tov, today is Yom Tov. Should I cut? Should I cut? Should I cut? Should I cut? Three times. Everything to make it very... And pink would come. In, in the story of Megillat Rus, when Rus arrives with Naomi, coming back to Beit he sees this enormous crowd. The crowd had gathered for the cutting of the Omer. Because Ruth left with Naomi, they had a Seder, and Naomi was planning to slip out in the morning. And after the Seder, that was the farewell. You'll, you'll pardon the pun, was the final supper. Because for Naomi, was leaving Moab, you're going to go back to the land of Israel. But Ruth figured it out. And she woke up Orpah. And they decided to go along with 
Naomi, and Naomi persuades Orpah to go home, but Ruth sticks to her, says, no, well, you go, I will go, your people are my people. Those, and they come, they walk the whole day of Pesach. And they come in the evening to Beit Lechem. And there's the cutting of the Omer. How much of the Omer uh, would, would actually be cut? So there was um, a significant amount. It says, it says uh, there was, it was 13 measures were cut. And from those 13 measures, then they would, they would um, dry it in like an oven. So it would be parched, it would be, it would be, it would be cured. And then after it be cured, they would separate. Because it's very, when it's moist and wet, you can't get flour out of it. So first they would artificially dry it out. And then it would be spread, they would separate it from the stalks. Then they would spread it out in the Beit HaMikdash overnight and it would dry. And then the next day it would gra- ground the flour and put through a number of different sieves. Sieves, I think, also 13 times. And from that, they would get a small amount of flour. And that flour would be mixed with oil. Because now they have any chametz. And oil doesn't have alkaline. You need alkalinity to create, to trigger the fermentation or chimots. They would mix it with only with, with oil. And then a, it would be waved in different directions, called Yom Hinef and the Gemara, the day of waving. It would be waved to bring Hashem's bracha in all directions and to demonstrate God's oneness. And then a fistful would be taken. The fistful is called a kometz. And it's not even a real fistful. The, the Kohen would reach into the, the collection of, of dough. And he would take out approximately a fistful, but then he would smooth it off with this finger and smooth it with this finger. So really all you had left was three fingers full of dough which Ramam says was a kezayit. That's the amount of an olive. And then that would be brought onto the Mizbech. First there was, an, there was something called frankincense added, a comet of frankincense added to the dough, and then sep- this was separated. So anyway, Mordechai was demonstrating to his students because the base of English hadn't been around for 70 years. There were no picture books. So this has to be passed from generation to generation. You can't really describe a comet only in writing. Today you can have a picture, but... So Mordechai is demonstrating it to them. And that's what the Gemara says. He was demonstrating to them the idea of the comets, of what was going on. So, so Haman says, he says, wow, he says, a little fistful of flour, eh? And they say, he says, yeah. And then what's that for? He says, no, he, Hashem pardons us. Hashem atones for us. And according to some of the opinions, they were saying we even talk about it. And it already brings us atonement. Because it's, that's what we can do now. That's the carbon we can do is talking about it, even talking about a fistful of flour. So he says, wow, he says, your fistful of flour is more powerful than my 10,000 talents, uh, gold pieces. My 10,000 kikar, kikar of, of, of gold shekels, of silver shekels. Why? Because he had tried to buy Achashverosh, but as the Ion Yaakov tells us in his commentary previously in the Gemara, he wanted to make Achashverosh meritorious and to do kindness. We already know from the Nebuchadnezzar who Daniel told him that if you do kindness, you'll get Hashem's blessing. They wanted to get God on their side. They knew the Jewish people had sinned. Therefore, God would surely abandon them. And to make sure that God would abandon them, he would make sure now to give this 10,000 silver gold, uh, pieces to be distributed to the poor. Social action. Okay, this is going to be a social action. And with this, they're going to have the merit, get God's blessing to destroy the Jewish people. But Haman knows that he's starting to fail. And he says, what could the Jewish people have done to undo this? And the students are telling him about this fistful of flour. He says, this is unbelievable. Your fistful of flour outpaces my 10,000 kikar of silver. That's, that's how the conversation goes according to the Talmud. Now, according to the Medrash, the conversation goes a little bit differently. According to the Medrash... Haman says to them, what are you guys doing? Uh, Mordechai says, go away. They said, no, no, we're not going to go away. We, we, and he says, okay, then let us, let us die out of prayer. So they finish praying. According to the Medrash, they seem to be praying together. They all finish praying. And then he didn't kill them yet. So, so what are they going to do? They go back to learning Torah. And Haman's just there. And he's, they're learning Torah. And what are they learning? So Yasvin ve'askin behilchas mitzvah soimer. According to the Medrash, talking about the Omer, and and in the Medrash it says that in the, in the Babylonian Talmud it says they were talking about the Komets. So the Medrash knows about the Gemara. They're written by different people. But it's like a, a crossover. So he, Haman asks them, "What are you? What are you? What are you doing now?" And he says, "This is what we're learning about." And he says, "So this Omer, this fistful, is it a fistful of gold?" And they said, "No." A fistful of silver that you give to God? They said, "No." So what is it? This is not even wheat. It's barley, which is a, of lesser quality. And then Haman says, wow, he says, you give this, this is very valuable. 
and he uses high denominations of money. They said, no, no, it's a small little bit of, little bit of barley flour. And, and Haman says to them, wow, this little bit of a few pennies of barley is worth more than my 10,000 pieces of gold. So again, very similar conversation, slightly nuanced, slightly different. But then at this point, Haman is like conceding defeat. And now Haman has to tell Mordechai the good news. You can only imagine how painful it must have been for him. So as this is all going on, he says to him, once they finish praying and all this is done, Haman has no choice. So Haman says, okay. He says to Mordechai, time to get dressed. I have to dress you in royalty. I have to dress you in royal robes. So Mordechai says, what, are you joking or something? I, you're not, I'm going to break the law? Insult Ahasuerus, insult the monarchy? I can't wear royal clothes. I haven't taken a shower in three days. I'm fasting. I'm, I'm disheveled. I can't do this. So he says, Matam Avaza Malchus, how dare you shame or bring disgrace to monarchy? Is Barnash Lovush Lavusha the Malchus of Leisachi? Did you ever see a person wear royal robes without bathing first? And the Persians are very into body odor. It was like a big thing for them. Till today. No, they're seriously, they're, they're into bathing and using all kinds of beautiful uh, perfumes and aromas. It's, 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 it's till today, it's in their culture. They, 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 they don't like body odor. They're very, so they're very into. He says, What am I kidding? With the body odor? You want to wear clothes like that? Are you kidding? Ahasuerus should bring back his royal robes, stinking from my, from my body odor, and then, the, and the, you, what, is a, is a setup over here? I can't do that. So, uh, Haman's got a problem here. And Haman can't say, don't be silly, just do it. Because what if Ahasuerus found out Haman was the one who did it? Remember, he's walking a tightrope now. Haman is actually terrified. Ahasuerus. <laughs> he's, he's the prime minister, but Vashti used to be the queen too. So, you're dealing with a very fickle monarch who can fly off the handle at any moment. And he said, do exactly what I told you to do. So, having no choice, he sighs, tries to get him a bath. Looks for a bath. Ozel. Ba Balano Vlayashkar. He looks to get him somebody to bathe him. In those days you didn't bathe yourself. Fancy people got bathed. Nobody did bathe him. So what's he gonna do? What's he gonna do? Ma Ovad. Osir Hartse Va Ayalaskha. He had to, so to speak, uh, pull up his britches and get do it himself. So now Haman, the Prime Minister, turned into Haman the bath attendant. <laughs> Does you see what happened over here? And then he wants to put the crown on his head. So he says, are you kidding? You can't wear a crown when you haven't had a haircut. Mordechai didn't take a haircut before Yom Tov. He found out this news. He never took a haircut. He was in mourning and sackcloth. He was overgrown. He says, are you kidding? A person should wear a crown without cutting his hair first? I can't do that. So what happens? So they look for a barber. They can't find any barbers. And I'll soon look in the Gemara. I'll find out what happened to the barbers. And what happened to the, to the people with, in the bathhouses. Ma'ava, what does he do? Ozil Abesi goes himself to his house. Va'aisi Safra, he brings the, uh, the scissors, uh, the, the machine to, to implement to, to cut his hair. Va'yosev Kamasaprali. And Haman is now a barber. Haman is now giving Mordechai a haircut. Now, why, why couldn't they find a barber? So the Gemara says that Esther anticipated all of this happening. And so she shut down all the bathhouses in the city. And she shut down all the barber shops by royal edict. What are you going to do? Shut down. Shut down. Royal king. Everybody's a holiday today. Holiday, you're prohibited from working today. Okay, the barbers are very happy. The barbers left work. Nobody didn't open the shops that day. The barbers, the, the bathhouse didn't were, were in a, if, uh, open for business. Muhammad is no choice. And according to this, the Gemara says not only did he have to go and, 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 and give up Mordechai a bath himself, he had to heat the water up. In those days, he didn't have hot water. He had to actually go and prepare the hot water for, for the bath too. That's, I think, the, the, the heating part is, is uh, added by the Mam lawyers. I think the Monas Halevi says that. Now, the natural thing, usually, most people take a haircut first and take a bath after. Why did it go the other way around? So some of the Mepharshim say it, it did go that way around. But because you put on the clothes first and after put the crown on, that's why it's said the other way around. But actually, now, why did Haman do this himself? Well, first of all, he couldn't find the barber. The barbers were not allowed to work. Okay, the barbers can't work. So Haman, didn't Haman have any, any children? Well, Haman didn't want anybody to know he has to do this. Haman himself went to get the barber machine. 
Why did he go get it himself? Some of the Mepharshim say because Haman used to be a barber. Haman's family, had a, was, they were barbers. His father was a barber before him and he used to be a barber. In fact, according to one version, he was a barber for over two decades. And Haman, very much, this was like his father's artifacts. It was his father's scissors. And he hid it away. He didn't, want, he didn't want to throw it out because it was like a family heirloom. But he didn't want to leave it out in the open because he was ashamed that he came from a family of barbers. He fancied himself as being a prime minister, a royal, an aristocrat. But the truth is neither he, he nor Ahasuerus, not, neither were aristocrats. Ahasuerus was the son of a stable, a stable master and he was the son of a barber. So he had this hidden away and only he knew where the, the hair cutting machine was. He knew where the scissors are. So he had to go get the scissors himself. You picture this whole scene over here, what was going on this day. Haman comes in, he just has this exchange, has to run off to go get the machine so he can give a haircut, gives Mordechai a haircut, bathes him, and dresses him. Now, as Haman is doing this, he's overcome with grief. He just, he begins to talk to his arch enemy. He begins to like express himself. And he says, he says to Mordechai, where is this? He says to Mordechai, Vai gavra. Woe is to the father of this person. He doesn't want to say, woe is to me. Woe is, woe is to my father, the father of this person. He says, look that here I was, a ruler. Imagine he was hours away from becoming uncontested. Only the king could have interrupted him. And, and look what happened to me now. And now I'm a barber. So Mordechai tells him, He's, I'm, 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 I'm a, bath, a bathing attendant and a barber. So Mordechai says to him, you did this to yourself, mister. Like, you did this to yourself. And according to another version, Mordechai said to him, it's a perfect fit. You think I don't know you used to be a barber? You think I don't know your family? Mordechai and Haman had been off for a long time. There's a history over here. And in fact, Mordechai at a certain point saved Haman's life because they only had a little jug of water and they were coming back from battle. And Haman drank and ate like a glutton and Mordechai was measured. And then Haman wanted Mordechai's food and they didn't know what would be. So Haman agreed to be Mordechai's slave. And he gave him some of the, wa of the water and the refreshments he had. And a little while later, they were discovered and rescued. But Haman used to have, Mordechai had this, this uh, contract written on the bottom of his shoe that said that Mordechai is Haman's slave. So according to one version, Haman says to Mordechai, I don't understand. 10,000 sh silver shekels I gave of tzedakah. Why didn't I merit God's blessing? And Mordechai's response to him is, whatever is yours actually is really mine. You just, you just, you just deny the law. And therefore, you weren't giving tzedakah with your own money, so your tzedakah was worthless. <laughs> it's like this, is ex this exchange is going on. Mordechai was afraid of being killed. Now, all of a sudden, it's like he's needling Haman. So much so that our sages ask, How, aren't you supposed to be sad when your enemy falls? You don't laugh? And, and the Gemara answers, yeah, not when it's an anti-Semite, not when it's a Nazi. When it's one of your own, unfortunately, we get into fights with each other. Don't be joyous when you see your enemy falter. But when, when, it's, a, when it's a Haman, there's no problem being joyous. So Mordechai says to him, it's a perfect fit. Welcome back to what you really should be. That's what you are. You're a barber and a bath attendant. You're doing great at it. Anyway, he has no choice. He has to swallow his pride. And, and he's got to do what he's got to do. And the, in the Targum Shani, it, uh, it speaks about this. Uh, and also very, very descriptive and beautiful. And Haman, Haman, the way he addresses Mordechai, he says, Mordechai HaTzadik, son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Take off your sackcloth. Take off your ashes. God has heard your prayers and, and you are beloved before God. You pray and he listens and, and, he, and he saves you from your enemies. You know, come Mordechai and, and you, you have to eat. But Mordechai said, I, I've been fasting. I haven't eaten. I don't have strength to ride on a horse. So there's food brought from Esther's feast and Esther, Mordechai knew, kept kosher. So, and I guess it was presented as vegan or whatever. So Haman said, you can eat this. So the royal feast that he was invited to, he's busy feeding this to Mordechai. So he was also a waiter, according to the Targum Shaini. He feeds Mordechai the food, gives him a bath, haircut and a bath, and then he has to be his dresser, his personal dresser, because this is like robes. You couldn't just slide into them. You need somebody to dress you up in them. He has him dressed up in, 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 in these robes. And he says, look at this miracle that God has done for you. He says, I came to get you to swing on a, on a gallows, and the king has you instead riding on a horse. I came to, to, to tie you in ropes, and instead I'm tying your belt of the royal robes. 
I came to, to kill you, and instead I'm raising you up to greatness and putting a crown on your head. And Haman is lamenting his situation. Anyway, after all this happens, Mordechai has to go onto the horse. So Haman says, get on the horse. Mordechai says, I, I can't. He says, why not? He says, I'm too weak, I'm fasting. You have to help me. So Haman has to bend down, and Mordechai steps on him to get up into the horse. And Haman does all these things because he's afraid if he won't do exactly what the king said, the king will know about it. And Mordechai will say, we'll say to Mordechai, why didn't you ride the horse? And he will say, I, I couldn't get up there. I told him I couldn't get up there. So Mordechai has him climbing on his uh, back. According to another version, he says, I'm old. Mordechai says, I'm old. I'm an old man. Haman says, I'm old too. And Mordechai says, yeah, but I didn't put myself in this situation. You did. <laughs> So Haman bows down and has Mordechai. Remember, he wanted Ham Mordechai to bow to him. Haman has to bow and have Mordechai step on his back to get onto the horse because he can't get any help. He has to do it himself. The king said, you do all of this. And now we have, now we go back to the Pasuk. This is the missing links, the missing pieces. Not alluded to in the Pasuk, but Marsha says this is the tradition that we, we received. And he, so he leads him riding on the horse in the center of the city. And he's calling out before him. He's proclaiming as he was supposed to. This is what happens to a person. And so when, when he does this, it says, the Gemara says that at that point, <coughs> he was making his proclamation and they end up going by the house of Haman, because they went through all the prominent streets in Shushan. And Haman lived in a very prominent street, his gorgeous compound, beautiful palace. And they went by Haman Street. And this will become very <coughs> meaningful, as you'll see in a moment. But first, before we go to what happened in, in the street, the, the Medrash says that as they were walking, everybody was saying something. Kivan de Rachiv, as they begin to ride to the city, Hischel Mordechai Mikalis. Mordechai begins to praise Hashem. And he begins to chant Psalm 30. God has, ri has raised me. For I am, I was, I was, uh, I thought I was, I was emptied. I was brought low. But Hashem has raised me up. I thought I was impoverished. But he said, You didn't allow my enemies to rejoice over me. Hashem My Lord God, you heard me. But Tibreni healed me. Hashem Mishael Nafshi. God, you raised my soul up from the, from the abyss. From the Sha'ol. I thought I was hopeless. You gave me life when I thought it was all over. Remember, Mordechai was preparing a few moments ago for his death. He was preparing to be murdered like Kiddush Hashem. So this, was his, this is how he responded. He burst into praise to Hashem. And the Gemara says, what were the, what were the Hasidim saying? What were the students of Mordechai saying? So the Gemara says, Hasidim. They were saying the same for also Psalm 30. They were saying, let his righteous, let his pious ones sing to him. Let them acknowledge his wondrous deeds. In a moment you're in God's wrath, because of course the story of Purim came from God's wrath, and then when God wants, then you're living again. In the evening, we went to sleep with, with sadness, mourning. Mourning is broken, and now it's jubilation. We're, 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 we're so happy. So they were all paraphrasing Psalm 30 which speaks about these highs and lows, these extremes. The Medrash says, what was, he, what was he saying? And the Medrash says that Haman was this very learned person. He knew the Psalms. And he was also chanting the same Psalm. He was mumbling the Psalm. What was he saying? I said in my own salvation, I can never be brought low. I'm invincible, I said. And what happened? With your will, you made my mountain strong. And now, your face has been hidden from me. And of course, there's an allusion to Esther over there. And I'm totally freaked out. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Esther, what was Esther saying? Because the Gemara says Esther came running to see this. She was, she was crying with joy to see Mordechai wearing royal clothes, being led to the, 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 the streets of Shushan by Haman. What was she saying? You got, you got, I called out. And to God, I prayed, what will, what will you gain out of me being killed? What will you gain from my blood? Beritil Shach is going down. Does dust know you? Can it, can it sing your praises? Can it say your truth? This is because Esther risked her life going to Achashverosh. And she said, 
And instead, now I'm thinking, I'm cry- I cried out to you, God, and you responded. The Medr says, Knesset Yisrael, what did the Jewish people there, what did they say? Shema Hashem v'choneini. They said, Hashem has heard us. Hafachta mispadi l'machli. Hashem turned our mourning into joy. So Psalm 30 includes the res- everybody's responses. And this is, this is uh, from Mordechai to the, to the students, from Haman to Esther to the Jewish people. And the Gemara finishes off, the Medrash finishes off, it says, Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, what was God saying? And God was saying, Laman yezem erech ha-chavad v'le yidayim ha-shem ed-kai le That, uh, that the, in order to bring, to bring you honor, Hashem is not silent, and in the end, Hashem took care of everything. So this Psalm 30 encapsulates everybody's responses. Now the Medrash also tells us, and the Tagum Sheni says, that as Haman is preparing to, to mount Mordechai on the horse and start to go, 27,000 young people came. And these people were, so to speak, um, they, they, were, what, what they, had, they had in their hands, they had, they had the goblets and cups, gold, gold cups and silver goblets. And a whole entourage was running along the side of Mordechai. So this was a parade. Mordechai is the center of the parade, Haman leading him on the horse. And these people with flashing gold and silver goblets running through the street alongside, chanting along with Haman, because Haman, how, how, how loud could one person scream? This is a royal parade. And they're all saying, This happens to the person, who the king desires his, his glory. So the question, of, of course, is what's up with the cups? Why was that important? And the Mepharshim say that the cups was an allusion to why this was happening. You may remember that the reason that the king wanted to reward Mordechai is because he saved, Mardukh, he saved Achashverosh's life. What was the plot? I shared this with you, I think, in the last class, two classes ago. Big Son and Seresh were, say, were, were, were moaning that Achashverosh keeps asking for drinks. Mm-hmm. The whole night they were up bringing him drinks. So they decided to poison his drink. Mm-hmm. And then Esther changed that because Mordechai found it out. So the cups represented the cup of poison and the cup of water. Two cups, the gold and the silver, which was kind of the subtle message as to why Mordechai is being honored. Now, all this is going on, a royal parade, a huge entourage, flashing gold and silver, somebody on a horse wearing royal raiments, and somebody looking totally broken, leading him in front. And they pass by Haman Street. So what happens? So the Gemara says, that as they go by Haman Street, When they went by in the street of where Haman was, so then at that point, what happened? Chazia brate the kaima aigra. His daughter saw from the roof. She was up on the roof. Now, in urban areas where people don't have sometimes large, large plazas, sometimes the roof, rooftops are used. I know when, when I lived in Buenos Aires, it was very common to see that. That's in Buenos, people use rooftops. But in many cities in the Middle East where the, the urban living is very crowded, rooftops, rooftop living is very common. So she was up on the roof. And Svara, she thought, Haide Rachev, the one who's, mar- who's riding, must be Avua, must be her father. Vahai, the Misane, the Mazgi Kame, the one who's going before him, must be Mordechai. Now, how could she not recognize her father? She's on a rooftop. She sees a parade. She didn't look well. She didn't see faces. She sees hats. She sees, she's, she sees uh, somebody looking, wearing, looking really, really down. And, he, and he's wearing like minister's clothes. And somebody on a horse the gold crown, and people are screaming and yelling. This is what the, one of the king honors. And remember, Haman himself thought this is probably what the king wants for him. So his family probably also had the same complex. They thought Haman's amazing. So she thought, for sure, who is this? It's Mordechai leading Haman. So she decided to have her fun and add a little bit to, add a little bit of color to the parade. So what does she do? She goes and fetches what's called a chamber pot, which is where people used to relieve themselves. And she figures, I can dump the chamber pot on the head of the person leading the horse. And she was a really good shot. She had perfect aim. And she empties the chamber pot from the roof. It's not like a skyscraper, you know. It's probably a second floor, a third floor. She didn't look too closely. And she enters the chamber pot on the one leading the, hor- the horse. The Gemara says, Shak, shkale atzitza. She took a, a, a earthenware, the veikise from the 
what you call in Canada a washroom, and they didn't have uh, running toilets or plumbing, so it was full. She hurled it on the head of her father. He just got doused. He looks up to see who threw that at him. But you look at somebody's eyes, you know who they are. He looks up, his eyes lock, and who is there? He sees his daughter. And she saw what she just threw on her father. And the Gemara says, when he raised his eyes up, she recognized her father, she fell from the roof and died. Sounds like a suicide. In, in grief, she committed suicide. Couldn't believe what she just did. So the Medrash has basically the same story. And the Medrash's story is, not on the roof, but from a high window. Lires, to see, Bitsliva to see the parade. And she thought, this is probably Mordechai being led to the gallows. She heard noises. So she said, ah, they're honoring my dad as he leans on Mordechai to the gallows. So what happens? Kivan Sharasa, once she sees Mordechai Rechav, Bavrua Machr of she saw, she, she, she thought this, this, this must be Haman that's being led by Mordechai. And so she throws the garbage, and when she sees, realizes what happened, says Hishlicha Atma. The Medr says she committed suicide. She didn't fall off the roof. She hurled herself off the roof, Omesa, and she died. So talk about a crushing turnaround, a crushing defeat. You know, we talk on Purim Vinahapach. Haman came that morning on top of the world, about to become the most po- second most powerful man of the world, uncontested, basically with monarchical powers to kill because he couldn't contain himself. Those extra few hours, because he barged into Achashverosh's royal chambers, everything is turned inside out. And now Mordechai is being treated like a king and Haman is covered with excrement and this is the way the day draws to a close. All, as they say, in a day's work. But it doesn't stop here. This is just the beginning. This is just the day. There's a whole evening, whole night activities that have to follow. Remember, he was invited to a party. So this, Bezrat Hashem, will continue in our next class. We'll talk about what happens in the aftermath of this stunning, crushing defeat that Haman, the evil, experienced. <laughs> Pretty fascinating stuff, eh? You never heard this story told that way. Never. This is, and this is one of the only verses, not like in the verse, this is just like oral tradition that, that, that comes along with it.